Thank you. Okay, good. Um, well, let me begin by thanking uh, Marco and Fabrizio for inviting me for this. This is actually a really a great opportunity, and it's, I'm really looking forward to getting some good feedback on this paper. And I also want to thank all my discussants, too, uh, Frankie and Alberto and Alfredo, too. Um, this is a paper that's going to appear, I should say, in a volume <clears throat> that's coming out soon uh, by Oxford. Uh, that's edited by Julia Smorchkova and uh, Christoph Deleja and, and Tobias Schlitz called What Are Mental Representations? And uh, the basic question that I want to address here is what sort of ontological stance do researchers in cognitive science take towards the different sorts of representational states and structures that are invoked in these different accounts of cognitive processes? Or maybe a more important and certainly more philosophical question is what sort of an ontological stance should they take towards these representational posits? And I think at first blush, you know, it seems like this is a pretty straightforward question um, with really only sort of two possible answers. Either you should adopt a realistic stance um, whereby you regard the posits to be very real entities that we can discover at some level of analysis in the brain, or you should be an eliminativist about these things and deny that they actually exist and suggest that we stop invoking them in our theorizing. Now, of course, you know, people can adopt a mixed view where maybe they're realist about some particular posits, but a limitivist about other posits. Um, but with regard to any particular posit, it seems like um, you would think your ontological choices are pretty limited. But as is often the case in the philosophy of cognitive science, things are not really quite so simple. And there have been some philosophers who suggested that there's actually a third option or maybe a range of options that's lying somewhere in between the space of straightforward realism and out and out eliminativism. And this third option, it comes in many different forms, but most of them imply that we should not regard the positing of representations in cognitive theories and in cognitive models as the positing of ontologically robust actual structures that have actual representational content and that help explain various cognitive capacities. Instead, representations posited by researchers should be treated more like some sort of useful fictions or maybe theoretical devices that are playing some kind of pragmatic or heuristic role in our theorizing. And so this third option is a view about what's happening in a scientific theory, theorizing that's at least at the subpersonal level, that's sort of like what Dan Dennett suggested about the attribution of propositional attitudes in just ordinary discourse, right? I mean, in both cases, it's suggested that we not regard the attribution of intentional states as involving any sort of commitment to actual physical structures that have real intentional properties independent of our own explanatory goals and purposes. So in my talk, what I wanna do is I wanna argue against this type of representational deflationism. I don't think it really captures what's going on in scientific theor theorizing about the brain. And I don't think it's the right way to regard the representational states and structures that are posited. I'm more simple-minded and I think the simple-minded options of robust realism or some kind of eliminativism are the more sensible options. So to argue for this, I'll first spell out what I think a robust sort of representational realism involves maybe say a little bit about what it should and should not be contrasted to. Then I'll offer a fairly general argument for favoring realism over different sorts of deflationism. And this is based to some degree on the functionality of representations. And then I wanna argue against deflationism. Now, of course, there's many different kinds of deflationism and I won't be able to look at all of them, but I do wanna take a closer look at three sorts of deflationism. Uh, Chomsky's view of representation without content, uh, Mark Sprevac's neural representational fictionalism, and Frankie Egan's account of an intentional gloss. And in all of these cases, I'm going to argue that the proposed anti-realism has deep problems or really actually collapses into a limitivism or just a more standard form of representational realism. Okay. So, what am I talking about when I talk about representational realism? Well, it's basically a claim about what the positing of representations in cognitive science and cognitive science theories and models should be thought to entail. So in terms of ontology, it's the view that when theorists 
put forward or posit the existence of representations in their explanation of some cognitive capacity, they're positing the existence of very real discoverable structures that at some level of analysis are playing the functional role of representing some property or entity or relation or some kind or object or something like that. So structures playing this role necessarily have some sort of representational content and will possess most of the features that we normally associate with representation, like non-derived intentionality and the capacity for misrepresentation. So in other words, representational models and theories are literally trying to describe objective reality as it exists in the brain. And if these representational structures they describe don't exist, then the model or the theory is just straightforwardly false in this regard and it should be abandoned. Now, robust representational realism is to be contrasted then with different sorts of anti-realism. But there are two types of anti-realism that need to be distinguished. First, you've got the kind of anti-realism that's just straightforwardly associated with the limitivism, and that involves the denial that the posited representational structures actually exist. So this sort of anti-realism is just simply a rejection of representationalism. You know, realists say that representations really exist, and the limitists say, no, they actually don't. But I think both sides more or less agree on what the truth conditions are for the theoretical claims and agree that the positing of representation should be taken literally. So my criticism isn't going to be targeting a limitivism, the limitivist style of anti-realism, because I think realism and limitivism are on the same side of the dispute that I really want to address. The second sort of anti-realism is what I want to focus upon and claims that both the realist and the eliminativist are mistaken about how we should be interpreting the posits of representations. So this view is more complicated because it involves the denial that the positing of representations ought to be treated as involving a commitment to objectively real discoverable structures playing a specific representational role and that actually have representational content. So, you know, this would include any sort of deflationary account that treats representational theorizing as a mere heuristic strategy or as a kind of instrumentalism or as some kind of fictionalist gloss. This sort of representational anti-realist denies that the value of theories that invoke representations to explain cognitive processes, that that value rests on whether or not there actually are discernible content bearing things that are playing a representational role. So to avoid confusion, I'll from here on out refer to this sort of anti-realism as deflationism or maybe sometimes non-realism. Now, it should also be noted that the term deflationism is also a little ambiguous and it's sometimes used to designate accounts of representations that are also referred to as liberalism. Liberalist accounts are very weak accounts of representation in the sense that in proposing really kind of minimal sufficient conditions for something to qualify as a cognitive representation. So for example, Markman and Dietrich have proposed an account whereby structures that are really doing little more than playing a mediating role in the processing would actually qualify as representations. Now, I've argued extensively against this kind of minimalist representationalism because I think that the structures described are not actually playing a representational role but I do think that the proponents of these views are realists. That is, they really do think that there are structures playing these mediating roles. So these accounts are misguided, not because they oppose realism, but because I think they mischaracterize causal mediators as representations. All right, now, while robust representational realism is a pretty strong view, I think it also should be noted that it's compatible with acknowledging um, some of the various problematic aspects of representations and how they wind up being posited. So, for example, I think it's compatible with at least some forms of indeterminacy, uh, both with regard to some things playing a representational role and with regard to the representational content associated with that role. <clears throat> so, with regard to the former, you know, you can be a robust realist and at the same time admit there's at least some cases where the question of whether or not a neural structure is actually playing a representational role 
can be fairly difficult to answer. Right? I mean, a lot of the things playing functional roles, we know there can be borderline cases where the actual role the structure is playing is difficult to determine, and we aren't really quite sure what to say. But that fact doesn't really undermine the existence of more clear-cut cases where we have a much clearer sense of whether or not the thing is playing the functional role in question. And with regard to the indeterminacy of content, I actually think that some degree of content indeterminacy is a common feature of many straightforwardly real representational systems. So, you know, does a gas gauge in my car, does it represent the level of regular unleaded gasoline currently in the tank, or just the level of fuel regardless of the grade, or the level of fluid in general, right? Um, I mean, thinking there's no obvious or determinate answer to this question, <clears throat> I don't think, does not make you into an anti-realist about the representational status of my fuel gauge. And I think the same point applies to various other types of representational devices, including cognitive representations. So the neurons in the frog's brain may be treated as representing flies, or maybe instead as representing small flying bits of food, and maybe there's no fact of the matter about which content attribution is actually correct. That doesn't mean anything goes or that the representational content of the neurons is simply a matter of convention or that the neurons aren't really representations of something independent of our interest. And as many telos and nanosis have emphasized, looking really closely at the representational job a structure has been selected to perform can greatly reduce this content indeterminacy. But you know, if the, at the end of the day, some degree of indeterminacy remains and it's unavoidable just because indeterminacy is endemic to most sorts of representational systems, then I think that would be something that a representational realist could live with. I mean, after all, most scientific realists recognize that the world we're trying to understand can be such that not every question about its nature has a determinate answer. Right. I think it's also true that robust representational realism is compatible with acknowledging just how hard it is to spell out exactly how a neural structure can come to play a representational role. But I mean, we all know just how difficult it is to provide a plausible, physical, naturalistic account of representation in the brain. And much of this problem is due to the fact that the role of, of representing is not a very straightforward causal role, right? I mean, representations um, in some way relay information, they signal things, they have content. But the mere fact that providing a naturalistic account of representation is difficult, that doesn't undermine the view that when we do provide such an account, it should be treated as an account of something actually instantiated in the brain and that has representational content. So yeah, accounting for neurological representation is tricky business, but trickiness is not a reason to be a deflationist. And finally, I think robust realism is compatible with the idea that representation occurs at higher levels of analysis. So representation tokens will ultimately need to be instantiated in some way by neurological states and structures. But if, say, a given account treats them as functional or computational states, or as parts of an algorithm that's not characterized in neurological terms, that wouldn't make the representations any less real, right? I mean, scientific entity realism is compatible with there being different levels of organization and explanation, and the entities invoked by the higher levels of description are certainly capable of being robustly real. All right, so why should we reject deflationism and instead be robust realists about representations? Well, I think one obvious answer is that realism seems to be the attitude adopted by most of the researchers and theorists who hypothesize that representations are part of the processes and mechanisms that give rise to cognition. So I think it's pretty easy to find quotes that at least suggest a realist attitude towards representations among these researchers. And it's actually really hard to find cognitive researchers, either in psychology or cognitive modeling or neuroscience, who explicitly put forth a deflationist perspective. On the Fosse, it seems a fairly strong form of realism is the most common attitude adopted 
by the actual theorists who posit the existence of representation in their theories of cognition. So given how rare it is for researchers to go out of their way to caution against a realist interpretation of the representations they invoke, I think we have some reason to think that by and large, for the most part, most cognitive scientists are not deflationist about representational states and structures and instead are realists. But as I noted earlier, a more interesting and philosophical question is the normative one. Right? I mean, regardless of what they actually do, what sort of ontological stance should the cognitive scientists and philosophers adopt towards the representational posits? I mean, after all, even if most cognitive scientists are realists, one can consistently maintain that this is a mistake and that some form of deflationism is the proper attitude to adopt. So how should this normative question be addressed? Well, first, I think it's possible for your attitude towards representational realism to be based upon your more general attitude about the scientific realism, anti-realism issue. So for instance, it seems like for many of the arguments marshaled in favor of scientific realism in general, especially scientific entity realism, those could be extended to support representational realism. So take, for example, Putnam's miracle argument, right? Where he argues that the success of science would be an unexplained miracle if the things and processes successful theories described weren't objectively real. Well, it seems to me that that sort of argument could easily be used to support robust representational realism. After all, it really would be bizarre if we had a cognitive model that A, proved extremely successful in explaining and predicting our performance in some cognitive task, B, posited the use of cognitive representations in that task, and yet C, did not literally describe how we did such a task because no such representations actually existed. It seems to me that that would be a really bizarre kind of situation. However, going the other way, it seems that anyone who's a non-realist or an instrumentalist about scientific posits in general could also conceivably extend this attitude to the representational posits in cognitive theorizing. So, for example, one popular reason why some people reject scientific entity realism is based on the idea that we should be robust realists only about what is actually observable. Right? So something like Boss von Frossen's constructive empiricism applies a non-realist or at least an agnostic attitude towards unobservable entities. And that attitude would presumably apply to the microscopic neurological structures that are functioning as representations. So one conventional motivation for rejecting realism about the posits of science would probably also provide support for rejecting representational realism. So the general arguments from the broader scientific realism debates could be marshaled either for or against representational realism. And on this score, maybe neither side's a clear winner. But suppose you address the realism issue on a more case-by-case -case basis, right? Well, then it's worth asking if there's anything specific about cognitive representational posits that might favor either a realist or deflationary interpretation. That is, is there something about the nature of representation itself or the way in which it's invoked in our theorizing that promotes realism or non-realism that tips the scales one way or the other? Well, I think one general consideration that favors realism is the fact that our notion of representation is a functional notion um, based upon the idea of something doing a specific sort of job. And as John Hoagland famously pointed out, representation is a functional status or a role of a certain sort. And to be a representation is to have that status or that role. So for the most part, representations are increasingly, it seems to me, treated as mechanisms or as parts of mechanisms that causally respond to certain stimuli and generate processes that guide or steer the cognitive system in various ways. And that implies that representations need to have the kind of realist ontological heft that allows them to causally interact with various other elements of the brain or cognitive system. Maybe another way to see this point is to pick up on uh, a point by Peter Godfrey Smith that our conception of representation in cognitive systems is probably modeled upon our understanding of non-cognitive representations on things like thermometers and gas gauges and maps and so on. 
So these non-cognitive representations are very real, concrete bits of the actual world that we rely upon. They're physical things that play an important role in our lives. And they certainly aren't ontologically weird things like abstract entities or modal facts, right? So insofar as researchers claim that our brains possess entities that are doing the same kind of thing, that is, our brains have neural states and structures that belong in the same functional category as these concrete representational devices we encounter every day, then I think we should take these claims at face value, right? I mean, for such claims to be true, it seems there really do need to be concrete structures that are in some way playing a representational role. And as far as I can see, the situation is really no different than when a cardiologist tells us that a section of the heart functions as a valve. We know this claim is true because there really are physical structures in the heart that open and close and allow something to flow in one direction in exactly the way other valves function. And if there's nothing in the heart that played that sort of role, that we know the role we know valves to play, then I think the cardiologist's claim would just be straightforwardly false, right? So I think the claims of cognitive researchers positing representations are naturally viewed in exactly the same way. If in explaining how the brain performs some cognitive task, a researcher claims that it employs neuronal structures that play a representational role, then it's really hard to see how such a claim ought to be interpreted as anything other than a straightforward truth of valuable claim about the functionality of actual mechanisms in the brain. And furthermore, it seems to me if something really is functioning as a representation, then it's a representation of or about something. Right, I mean, putting indeterminacy issues aside, I don't see how anything could be playing any kind of representational role without it also at the same time having some sort of actual content. Causing a representation that has no real content would be like characterizing something as a functioning pump, but then insisting that there's nothing, there's no fluid or gas or anything that's actually being pumped. So. Like in both cases, the functional role in question requires that certain conditions be met. And just as you can't have a functioning pump without something being pumped, so too you can't have a functioning representation without something being represented. That is, without there being some sort of representational content. All right. So given these sorts of considerations about representational function and content, it seems pretty clear to me that the default position one should embrace with regard to the representational posits in cognitive science is pretty robust realism, right? And so it seems to me the burden of proof then is on the non-realist, on those who claim that given the explanatory goals of cognitive science, a robust type of realism is in some way misguided and we should instead embrace some sort of deflationism. What I want to do now is I want to look at three really interesting examples of deflationism to see if that burden is met. And of course, I'm going to argue that it has not been met. Okay, the first example of representational deflationism I want to talk about comes surprisingly enough from Noam Chomsky. And I say this is surprising because Chomsky is you know, usually characterized as a champion of this psychological reality of inner rules and representations to account for our linguistic competence. But in a paper criticizing externalist interpretations of psychology, in other words, accounts that claim that science must appeal to representational content, Chomsky explicitly denies that the content of cognitive representations plays any sort of deflationary role in our theorizing, and indeed even seems to deny that representations have real content. So, for example, when talking about the research of David Marr and his collaborator, collaborator Shaman Ullman in investigating the, the visual system, Chomsky says, quote, his studies of determination of structure from motion used statistoscopic presentations that caused the subject to see a rotating cube, though there was no such thing in the environment. If Ullman could have stimulated the retina directly, he would have done that, or the optic nerve, there's no meaningful question about the content of the internal representations of a person seeing a cube under the conditions of the experiment, or if the retina is stimulated by a rotating cube, or by a video of a rotating cube, or about the content of the frog's representation of a fly or of a moving dot in the standard experimental studies of frog vision. 
no notion like content or representation of figures within the representation with figures within the theory. So there are no answers to be given as to their nature. Um, the ch representation should not be understood re relationally um, as representation of. All right, so while adopting what appears to be a realist stance about the representational vehicles, Chomsky clearly rejects the notion that they have any sort of objectively real content that researchers care about. And this leads Frankie to suggest that Chomsky is really endorsing something like a kind of ersatz notion of representation. Chomsky states that representations in cognitive theories are, quote, not to be understood relationally as representations of. For Chomsky, then, representations appear to be inner elements that play a causal role in the processing, but stand in no real special intentional relation to other things. So at least initially, this seems to put Chomsky in the deflationist camp, since he appears to be denying the cognitive reality of representational content. All right, now, there's some aspects of Chomsky's account that are a little unclear to me. Like, first, it's not very clear to me whether Chomsky believes he's actually expressing Ullman's or Marr's views about content, or if instead he's expressing what he thinks is the right view about content, his own view. If it's the former, then I think there are plenty of passages from these researchers that suggest he's misinterpreting their views. So to be charitable, let's just assume that Chomsky is simply putting forward his own position on how we should think about representational content. Secondly, it's not completely clear to me why he adopts this skeptical attitude about content, but at least part of his motivation appears to be the fact that representational states in the visual system can be generated by different causes. As he notes, an image of a rotating cube could be generated by an actual rotating cube in the visual field, or a tachistoscopic presentation, or at least in principle directly stimulating the retina or the optic nerve. So for Chomsky, it seems that it's this feature of representations in the visual system that undermines any temptation to regard representations as representations of something. For him, it seems that if a state can be caused in different ways, then there's no theoretical value in assuming that the state has any sort of objectively real content. Now, if this is Chomsky's motivation, it strikes me as a poor justification for rejecting a realist perspective on representational content. I mean, no one ever doubted that inner representations with a certain content can be triggered by lots of different causes. And this is precisely why nearly every simplistic causal theory of content has been abandoned by everybody, right? I mean, it's why causal theories have become much more sophisticated, in part by introducing further factors like teleology. And these further factors enable us to distinguish the content grounding causal links from the aberrant ones. So in other words, there's various factors that allow us to say why an image of a rotating cube really does represent a rotating cube and if it's generated when there's no cube present, then what we have is a straightforward case of misrepresentation of the world being represented in a way that doesn't correspond to how it actually is. However, even if there is some residual indeterminacy of content, it certainly wouldn't follow as Chomsky puts it that there's no meaningful questions about the content of the internal representations. I mean, it seems quite the contrary. There are a number of perfectly meaningful and important questions about how we should characterize <clears throat> what's being represented in the environment and how that representational content enables the cognitive system to succeed at whatever particular cognitive task it's performing. Um, but look, here's the deal. For our purposes, I don't really need to argue against Chomsky's content skepticism. All I need to argue is that if you is that you can't be a content skeptic like Chomsky and at the same time characterize the structures that Ullman and Marr and other cognitive researchers posit as representations. So Egan plausibly suggests that Chomsky's an eliminativist about content. I think she's right about that. But I would just add that if you're an eliminativist about representational content, then you're just a straightforward eliminativist about representation. As I noted in the last section, if there's no representation of, if there's nothing that is actually being represented, then there's no representations. 
Well, while Chomsky writes as though he accepts the invoking of inner representations in these theories of perception, he really can't do that and at the same time deny that an essential aspect of representation, the content, is non-existent. He really can't have it both ways, it seems to me. So Chomsky's ersatz representationalism collapses into just straightforward limitivism about inner representations. It seems to me there's really no third option here. Okay, the second kind of deflationism I want to look at is much more overt and has recently been proposed by Mark Sprevac. So Sprevac's interesting proposal is to regard the invoking of neurological representation in cognitive theories as a type of fictionalism, whereby the invoking should not be viewed as an attempt to describe actual neural structures in the brain. As Mark puts it, according to NRF, that's the Neural Representational Fictionalism, statements of the following form are false. Neuron brain region activity X represents Y. However, statements of that form nevertheless serve a useful purpose and are fact stating. So just as some philosophers have endorsed fictionalism as a way to deal with problematic things like modal facts or abstract entities, Spreeback suggests that a similar strategy might work for neural representations. Now, as Spreeback notes, neural representation fictionalism is at least initially appealing because it retains what's attractive about both realism and eliminativism. On the one hand, you can avoid the counterintuitive consequences of eliminativism by retaining a place for representations in our theorizing. Right? I mean, the paradigm of representationalism wouldn't need to be abandoned. But on the other hand, as with eliminativism, we could avoid the difficult task of providing a completely naturalistic cognitive or neurological account of representations with content. So if representations are treated as useful fictions, then we can legitimize our representational theorizing without committing ourselves to explaining just how neurological structures actually come to play a representational role. And Spreeback also develops a kind of fictionalist hypothesis by noting that many fictional statements have a kind of weird relation to the truth that's somewhat complicated. So of course, many of them are just <clears throat> straightforwardly false in an ordinary sense, like the claim that Sherlock Holmes is a detective based in London, that's just false. But you could also say there's a context in which statements like that are in some sense true. So within the fiction, The Hound of Baskerville, it's actually, in a sense, true that Sherlock Holmes is a brilliant detective based in London who solves an important mystery. So the idea behind neural representation fictionalism is that within the context of a representational theory or model of cognition, the claim that the brain employs in our representations is true, even if it's not straightforwardly true outside of that context. So a proponent of neural representational fictionalism would endorse a claim like this. In the context of the neural representation fiction, neuronal, neuronal activity X represents Y. All right, so what are we to make of this? Well, first off, in fairness to Spreevac, it should be noted that he doesn't really offer an outright endorsement of neural representation fictionalism. In fact, he presents a couple of compelling arguments against it towards the end of his paper. Instead, he sort of puts it out there as a proposal to consider. It's a compelling idea as something that's worth exploring, and I agree, so let's do so. Well, I actually think there's a couple of really big problems concerning the compatibility between neural representational fictionalism and the central goals of cognitive science and I don't really see how these problems are gonna be overcome. The first concerns the sort of contextualized truthfulness that fictional claims allegedly have. Neural representation fictionalism implies that there's a context, the context of the neural representational fictional theory that allows us to say that the claims of the representational theory are true, even if they aren't true, even if they aren't true in the ordinary sense or if there are no representations. And the immediate problem is that it seems to me the scientific enterprise doesn't really provide such a context, right? I mean, with a deliberately fictional story, 
were asked to entertain a possible world with various characters and events and so on. And within that possible world, certain things exist and events occur that do not exist or occur in the real world. By contrast, cognitive theorizing isn't trying to describe a possible world. Like most scientific theorizing, it's basically attempting to describe and explain and predict the real world. In science, a purely fictional account of some phenomenon is exactly what we're trying to avoid. In cognitive theorizing, there really is no contextual separation between the way things are depicted in the model or the theory on the one hand and the way things are in the real world on the other hand. The way things are depicted in the context of the theory is supposed to correspond to the way things are in reality. So truthfulness within the context of, a con of cognitive science is really just good old fashioned truthfulness. So the sort of you know truth within a story context that might apply to some sorts of fictions does not really apply to the scientific realm. Now, of course, a representational fictionalist can admit all this, abandon any appeal to the truth, but still claim that there is some sort of pragmatic or instrumental value in invoking representations, even when they don't actually exist. But this brings us to the second problem. It seems to me the pragmatic goals of science are much, much harder to achieve with fictional theories than they are with theories that accurately describe what's really going on. And in fact, Spivak acknowledges that with regard to a couple of the pragmatic goals of representational theorizing, fictionalism appears to be a non-starter. So one goal is providing the best explanation of a cognitive process, but surely one of the main features of the best explanation is gonna be that it accurately captures what's really taking place in the relevant system, and that would seem to undermine the fictionalist approach. And secondly, a traditional objective of science is to account for the causal structure of reality. Yet, it seems quite clear that fictional entities cannot actually engage in any causal relations. But there are other pragmatic goals that Spivak suggests it's at least possible that a fictionalist approach could achieve. So, for example, a fictionalist treatment of representation could possibly allow us to nevertheless make accurate predictions about behavior or cognitive phenomena. Because, after all, past theories that have invoked non existent entities have nevertheless generated accurate predictions. Also, fictionalism may still allow us to provide at least a useful description of neural processes as sometimes helpful descriptions in other areas of science employ fictional entities like the perfectly elastic billiard ball like atoms that you find in the kinetic theory of gases. And finally, fictionalism may still permit us to appeal to representations for intervention and manipulation just as someone might invoke a, a fictional centrifugal force in order to manipulate spinning objects. Well, look, I acknowledge that it's indeed possible that theories which posit purely fictional cognitive representations could make good predict predictions, provide useful descriptions, and allow for successful intervention. That's possible. But that strikes me as far too weak of a standard for evaluating any proposed sort of fictionalism. Right? I mean, it's possible for any bad theory that in the long run ought to be abandoned to nevertheless be beneficial in these ways, at least temporarily. What matters is whether or not there are any reason to think neural representational fictionalism is likely to be helpful in these ways, whether it's probably going to be more pragmatically beneficial in the long run than theories that accurately describe the mechanisms and processes underlying cognition, and I'm aware of no accounts, including Sprevax, that provide such reasons. But it seems that the burden is on the proponent of representational fictionalism to explain why an account that posits representational states and processes that in fact are not real would prove over time to be more pragmatically beneficial than a fact-based account. And as far as I can see, this burden really hasn't been met. Now, by contrast, I think it's actually fairly easy to provide reasons for thinking that theories that accurately describe the structures and mechanisms and processes in any given system, including the brain, are far more likely to deliver on the various pragmatic goals than theories that are divorced from reality in the way a fictional theory actually is. A theory is far more likely to generate accurate predictions, provide helpful descriptions, and allow for successful intervention 
if the mechanisms it invokes are objectively real and doing what the theory says they're doing. And that's just for the simple reason that accurate non-fictional theories provide a much better understanding of the phenomena and things like prediction and description and manipulation are enhanced by greater understanding. So in short, while it's possible for the pragmatic goal to be achieved with a theory invoking fictional entities, it's far less likely to occur than when we have a theory that appeals to the actual mechanisms and states underlying some phenomena. So let I me mean, look at things this way. So at the present, maybe we're uncertain about whether the representational posits and cognitive theories are objectively real. So there's really two possibilities with regard to what's really going on in the brain. Either the positive representations exist or they don't. So consider the first possibility and suppose that the representations the researchers posit really do exist. Well, if that's the case, then adopting a fictionalist interpretation would be a bad mistake. I mean, yeah, such an interpretation may get us off the hook in terms of explaining how representation happens in the brain. But if representation really is happening in the brain, then you know we should get to work and do the hard job of providing an explanation of how that's actually happening. Fictionalism would not only provide the wrong attitude about the ontological status of representational posits, it also encourage a kind of counterproductive explanatory apathy that would hinder real scientific progress. Now going the other way, suppose that there really are no cognitive representations of the sort that researchers posit. Then the question becomes this, which development would lead to a better outcome for cognitive science? Would we be better off if we continue to embrace representationalism and representational theories, yet treat those representations as fictional entities? Or would it be better if we instead came to see representationalism as a deeply flawed paradigm, abandoned it altogether, and started developing a new perspective on the nature of cognition? Well, in addressing this question about how we should deal with theoretical posits that are not really part of the causal physical world, I think the history of science provides some guidance. I mean, it suggests that eliminativism is the proper route. Notice that fictionalism was always an option regarding entrenched theories in the past that posited entities that we came to regard as unreal. I mean, there could have been folks defending a fictionalist interpretation of theories involving phlogiston or the celestial spheres or the Elan Vital and so on. But in all of those cases, it seems clear that a fictionalist approach would have been a big mistake. Adopting a fictionalist stance towards these non-existent things would have been both epistemically and pragmatically disastrous because it would have under, undermined the development of more accurate theories that were ontologically correct. If neural representations don't exist, then adopting a fictionalist attitude would be equally unwise. Fictionalism would hinder our acquisition of a better theory, both in terms of epistemic and pragmatic goals, a theory that would give us a better understanding of the structures and processes and mechanisms underlying cognition. Now look, I will make one concession to the neural representation fictionalist. My concessions with regard to the way we sometimes talk about information. We often speak of information as if it's something that gets carried by representations or is passed on or is relayed or stored or something like that. Information talk sometimes appears to reify information, suggesting that it's a kind of thing or a kind of substance. And I think we should really regard all this language as just figurative and treat information qua thing as a kind of helpful heuristic. What is real, of course, is the existence of some kind of correspondence between states of representation and other parts of the world, plus the ways in which various systems exploit that arrangement. And that correspondence and exploitations is what we're really talking about when we talk about information being carried or being relayed. With regard to this figurative language of information quay thing, then I think, okay, some sort of weak fictionalist interpretation may be the proper route to take. So I'll concede that there. All right, finally, the last uh, account I wanna give, uh, about, uh, I wanna address of deflationism is Frankie's account of her sort of notion of an intentional gloss. And it's her own account of computational content in different sorts of cognitive theories. And in particular, in Marr's account of early visual processing and Shadmire and Weiss's theory of motor control. Now, I think Frankie's account is really important because it's really firmly grounded in actual cognitive theorizing. And I really think she should be commended to really try to capture what's happening, what's really happening in the science. And moreover, I should note at the outset that I regard her account as only kind of maybe a very weak sort of deflationism or a quasi-deflationism. 
I'm going to try to push her a little bit more in the direction of realism. Um, and I think while she accurately describes the nature of these representational theories, it's her retreat from a robustly realist account of cognitive content that I find uh, a bit problematic. So Frankie argues that computational theories of cognitive processes typically involve representations with two very different sorts of content. First, there's a type of representational content that's associated with a computational function that's being instantiated. And as Frankie notes, this function is typically mathematical in nature and indeed involves a function with which we have some prior familiarity. So for example, in Marr's account of early visual processing, there's a proposed mechanism that's used to derive zero crossings, which are significant changes in light intensities from light intensity values. And according to Marr, this subsystem computes a function involving a Laplacian operator. It's an image smoothing filter that, as Frankie puts it, computes the Laplacian as a Gaussian. Now, we don't need to worry too much about the mathematical details here. The key idea is that the inputs and outputs of this function, its arguments and, math and, and, and values are mathematical entities. But of course, since mathematical entities can't be instantiated in the brain, then the system uses representations of these mathematical entities as inputs and outputs. And the same is true, she argues, in a variety of other computational theories in cognitive science. Secondly, there's also the representational content associated with these same inputs and outputs that allows us to see the relevance of this mathematical function to the relevant cognitive task in question. So the visual system computes a, computes a function with a Laplacian operator for a reason. It has a specific role to play in visual processing. Basically, it converts representations of light intensity into, very roughly, representations of boundaries and edges in the real world scene. So this content is referred to as cognitive content, and it allows us to understand the psychological role that the mathematical computer is playing in the broader cognitive capacity that we want to have explained. So in short, for Frankie, the input-output representations of the computational subsystems have two sorts of content. One type of content is mathematical in nature, accommodating the mathematical function being computed. And the other type of content is non-mathematical and involves real world properties and things that are germane to the cognitive task in question like edges and boundaries in the world. So this strikes me as a really helpful and really scientifically grounded way to think about content and computational theories. Um, it's closely related to what I have referred to as the input output notion of representation. Well, I actually think Frankie's account is a lot more sophisticated in that it captures this duality of content that I think is indeed there in many computational cognitive theories. I'd only add that maybe the account doesn't need to be restricted to mathematical functions. It seems it could work well for various logical or syntactic or other formal operations. Maybe you could have an inner computer doing something like modus ponens and it's converting any input conditional and ante antecedent into an outer consequence. But there is another aspect of Frankie's account that I find a bit more problematic. According to her, only the mathematical content is essential to the inputs and outputs of the computational system. The more conventional cognitive content involving real world properties and parameters is simply what she calls an intentional gloss. The assignment of cognitive content is parochial and dependent upon our own peculiar explanatory interests. So she states, cognitive contents are not part of the essential characterization of the device and are not fruitfully regarded as part of the computational theory proper. They are ascribed to facilitate the explanation of the cognitive capacity in question and are sensitive to a host of pragmatic considerations. Hence, they form what I call an intentional gloss, a gloss that shows in a perspicuous way how the computational mathematical theory manages to explain the intentionally described explanandum with which we began. Contents defined on distal objects and properties are appropriate to the cognitive domain. What I call the cognitive contents are not in the theory. They're in the explanatory gloss that accompanies the theory where they're used to show that the theory addresses the phenomena for which we sought an explanation. Okay, so in Frankie's dual content account of computational theorizing, the mathematical content is essential domain or environmental neutral, and largely independent of our explanatory interests. By contrast, the cognitive content is not essential to the input-output representations, at least with regard to the operation 
of the inner computational device. The cognitive content is more of an add-on that facilitates our own idiosyncratic psychological expository inputs. So to me, that sounds at least like a quasi-deflationary interpretation of cognitive content. So what motivates this depreciation of cognitive content? Well, to me, it's a little unclear, and maybe we can get clear on this today. I do understand how it's not essential to the system qua mathematical computer, but why not say the cognitive content is essential to the role a relevant computational subsystem is playing qua psychological mechanism? I mean, given that Mars computational subsystem has been selected by evolution to play a specific cognitive role pertaining to vision involving representing specific features of the environment like light and boundaries, it seems that the cognitive content is as real as representational content actually gets. Now, one apparent reason that Frankie dim diminishes the cognitive content is the fact that the system computing the particular mathematical function could compute the same function in a completely different system with a completely different overall role, and thus with different cognitive contents. And as she puts it, quote, the representational vehicles do not have their cognitive content essentially. If the mechanism characterized in mathematical terms by the theory were embedded differently in the organism, perhaps allowing it to subserve a different cognitive capacity, then the structures would be assigned different cognitive contents, end quote. So the subsystem that computes the Laplacian of the Gaussian filter in our visual system could conceivably be plugged into a different system to perform the same mathematical computation for a process that has actually nothing to do with light intensity or edges, right? So for example, it could at least in theory, say, be plugged into our auditory system, in which case the mathematical content would remain quite similar, but then the cognitive content would correspond not to light intensity and edges, but presumably to some sort of acoustic properties in the auditory environment. So I agree with Frankie that the mathematical mini computer is portable in this way, but I don't see why the interchangeability of the embedding system has any bearing at all on the status of the representation's current non-mathematical content, right? I mean, biological subsystems often play their primary role only by virtue of being embedded in a very specific system that brings with it all the relational properties that help define that role. So, you know, I mean, our hearts really do have the function of pumping blood, and that fact doesn't change, even if in principle our heart could be removed and plugged into an alien's body where it would pump something very different. With regard to representational systems, there are many robustly real representational devices with a particular content that would nevertheless be transformed if that device were relocated in a different kind of embedding system. So the gauge that currently tells me how much fuel I have left in my car could conceivably be embedded in a very different kind of system. And depending on the details, the gauge could then come to represent something else, like you know how much water is left in some holding tank. But that fact doesn't in any way imply that right now, when I describe it as actually representing fuel levels, I'm merely providing some sort of heuristic interpretive gloss. So let's think about one of Marr's own examples that he employs to illustrate his understanding of computation and representation. So Marr asks us to consider a cash register and the adder subsystem that is one of its internal components. And as Shagrer has forcefully argued, it really is important for Marr that we understand why the mechanism in the cash register is an adder and not, say, a multiplier. There's an adder in the cash register and not a multiplier because addition is the mathematical function that captures the financial reality of how combined tabs are determined. And like the mathematical systems Mar later describes in the visual system, the adder is computing a well-known mathematical function and thus its inputs are representations of numbers and its outputs are representations of sums. But of course, as the adder is functioning in a cash register, these numerical values also correspond with real world prices of individual items to be purchased and the overall amount of money that needs to be paid. Now, you could of course take that same adder and remove it from the cash register and put it in some other device, like say a coin counter. And in a coin counter, the adder would compute the exact same mathematical function, but now the numerical inputs would correspond to the values of coins as opposed to the prices of items. But still, I don't see how that transportability of the adder 
alters or diminishes the representational role of its inputs and outputs when it's in the cash register. When it's in the cash register, the adder play tally calculator really does have inputs that stand for item prices and outputs that stand for the overall amount that's owed. And I would think that the input output representations of the adder would seem to have this content essentially given the functional role it's playing in a cash register. So look, in one sense, I think Frankie's right. Treating the inputs and outputs representations of intercomputational subsystems as representing non-mathematical things is indeed critical for our explanatory purposes. But I don't see why we should treat this content as simply a gloss or an interpreter device added on for our local interests. Or if it is a gloss based upon our interests, it's no more of a gloss <clears throat> than say, assigning a functional role to biological subsystems, or for that matter, assigning a mathematical computational roles to neurological systems. In fact, I think a case could be made for saying that if we're gonna demote one of these contents to a non-essential gloss, <clears throat> it's actually the mathematical content and not the cognitive content. I mean, after all, the mathematical content helps us to classify the computational subsystem as an instance of a well-known mathematical function. But this classification is definitely beneficial, but it's dependent upon our idiosyncratic mathematical knowledge. For our understanding of the computational cognitive process, it seems we could conceivably get by without this classification. In other words, if we were mathematically unsophisticated and ignorant of Laplacian filters, we could still come to see the neurological mechanism of performing transformations on cognitive representations of light intensities to derive representations of boundaries or edges. Now, of course, I don't want to deflate any sort of representational content. <clears throat> Instead, my point's this. Well, I think Chomsky's account collapses into straightforward limitivism. I'd suggest that Frankie's account should be seen as collapsing into straightforward realism. There is a good reason to treat her notion of cognitive content as an essential dimension of the input and output representations performed in the specific cognitive system. The neurological structures that Marr posits as representations do stand for mathematical values, the values that correspond to very real features of the visual environment. <clears throat> the representation of those features is critical to his account of the way in which computational cognitive processing occurs in the visual system. Okay, so just a quick wrap up then. I think that robust representational realism can tolerate a lot of the problematic features of representation, including content indeterminacy. Uh, I think there's good reason for treating representational realism as the actual position of cognitive theorists. Uh, I think there's good reason for treating representational realism as the position we ought to hold. So I think the burden is on the deflationist to show why it's the wrong stance. And at least the deflationary accounts we've looked at here either have deep problems or I think they collapse into straightforward realism or good old fashioned limit, limitivism. And so I don't think that burden is met. And just the final slide here, just to sort of capture one of my favorite characters from pop culture, um, no half measures. So that's my talk.